Good morning.
Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Come, my heart says, God is calling your name. Your face, O oh Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not fear, for I am with you. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Come, my heart says, God sees and loves you. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Come, my heart says, there is nothing to fear, for God is with you. I believe that we shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. I will make a way in the wilderness. I will give a drink to my chosen people. The people whom I formed for myself, so they might declare my praise. We come to praise God for the new things God is doing. Let us worship. Let us bless God's holy name. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this special day a day when we celebrate one of the fine traditions of Chicago Theological Seminary. Welcome faculty, welcome staff, welcome students, trustees, friends, family members, and our many guests. Welcome the Lutheran Choir of Chicago under the direction of Dr. Wilbert Watkins. Welcome to our honorary degree recipients, Donald Cameron Clark, Jr., who will be our speaker today, and the Right Reverend Bishop George Washington Carver Walker Sr., who spoke at our Community Servant Award last night. Welcome to their family members and friends. And most especially, welcome to the graduating class of 2014. We come here today together to celebrate your graduation to honor the hard work you've done and the hard work we've done. Many of you began your journey at Chicago Theological Seminary because of our mission, vision, and commitments, because there's something particular and special about working together to bring transformation toward greater justice and mercy. And today, you commence again to a new space in your lives. We are proud of you. We recognize our mutual transformation. With these exercises, we look with bright hope to the stories yet to be told, to the religious leadership for the next. Let us celebrate. The Board of Trustees welcomes you to the spring 2014 commencement of the Chicago Theological Seminary. We rejoice with you, our graduates, and your families on your achievement. We celebrate your study, your collaboration, and the investment of yourselves in the work that you've done with our faculty and with each other. If you have the courage when you leave this place to go into the wood country, you'll hear more about that later. May you take with you only the very best memories of your time spent among us, and may God's blessings go with you always.
Good morning. Good morning. Commencement is an occasion to celebrate the fruit of learning and teaching. In addition to teaching, the members of our faculty are engaged simultaneously in service to the academy, religious communities, and other communities of accountability, and in the ongoing work of research and writing. I am happy to announce that Dr. Rachel Nikva, who holds our Rabbi Herman Shaman Chair in Jewish Studies, was promoted this year from assistant professor to associate professor with tenure. We were pleased to announce this year that Dr. Rami Nashashibi will be joining us in the fall as visiting assistant professor of sociology of religion and Muslim studies. And this year also saw the appearance of at least two faculty authored books. Our own Exploration Press published Professor Ted Jennings' book, An Ethic of Queer Sex, Principles and Improvisations. The book is based on materials generated in Professor Jennings' course on queer sexual ethics, which is being taught online again this fall, if any of you are looking for a way to spend your fall semester. And Professor Dow Edgerton released his newest book, Listening to Grief, as part of an innovative agreement that allows CTS to publish it chapter by chapter online in several different formats. In addition to calling attention to the availability of this book, I'd also like to note publicly that this is Professor Edgerton's last semester as a full-time faculty member. Starting in the fall, he will begin a period of phased retirement and so be away from the classroom for half the year. But we look forward to his return to the classroom next spring when he will be teaching for us as Professor Jennings begin, begins a phased retirement. And each of them will rotate one semester on, one semester off for several years thereafter. We will be celebrating in a more formal way their many years of service to CTS during this phased retirement period, and we look forward to their continued contributions to the classroom. But I trust that you will join me now in thanking Professor Edgerton for his service to Chicago Theological Center.
Psalm 81, verses 1 and 10 through 16. Sing aloud to the God our strength. Shout for joy to the God of Jacob. I hear a voice I had not known. I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of the land of Israel. Open your mouth wide, and I will fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Then I would quickly subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before God, and their doom would last forever. I would feed you with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock. I would satisfy you. Today's Gospel reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread all throughout the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today, this scripture, has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown what we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is that there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sinai. There were also many lepers in Israel at the time of the prophet Elisha, 
and none of them was cleansed, except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of the town, led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him over the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of the Spirit for the people of God.
President Hunt, Chairman Williams, and members of the Board of Trustees, Dean Stone, and members of the faculty, graduates, families, and friends. It's a privilege to be with you on this important occasion, and I'm humbled by this honor bestowed upon me, the opportunity to address all of you. While flattered, I also was a bit surprised when I, as an attorney, was asked to speak on this occasion of bestowing academic degrees to graduates of this religious institution. I suspect I was not alone. <laughs> I imagine the reaction of some of you when you learned that a lawyer would be delivering the commencement address was similar to that reflected in one of my favorite stories. And it's the story of the lawyer, the engineer, and the doctor who are arguing over which of their professions can be traced back furthest in time. The doctor proclaims that medicine has the longest historical legacy. I point to no less an authority than the Bible as proof of this. And in the first book of the Bible, it is written that God put Adam to sleep, extracted a rib, <laughs> anesthesia, surgery. Medicine is first among our professions. The engineer disagrees and states that engineering can be traced back further in time. I, too, cite the Bible as my authority because before the story of Adam and Eve, it's written that out of the chaos, God made the heavens and earth, the greatest engineering marvel of all time. Surely engineering is first among our professions. The lawyer responds, good doctor, good engineer, you have proven my point that the legal profession has the longest history. Who do you think created all the chaos to begin with? <laughs> In my remarks today, I'm going to attempt to bring some order to the chaos that you graduates might be experiencing as you leave this seminary and face the challenge of determining how to breast best bring your faith forward. On this topic, I have some opinions. Foremost among these is that ours is a faith that should not be confined to our churches and chapels, not limited to a day of the week. Ours is a faith that must be given voice when it needs to be heard. One time that I, as general counsel for the United Church of Christ, have believed that our faith needs to be heard is in response to the painful cases of children who are sexually exploited by religious officials or in connection with church programs. The horror of being sexually abused by your minister takes different forms in different children. I know one young boy who was sexually molested by his minister, and one way that the horror and loss of faith caused by that abuse manifested itself in him was by the boy getting satanic tattoos on his body. When the boy finally had the courage to explain to his parents why he had gotten the tattoos, they first looked to a counselor for help. The counselor advised them that it would be helpful in part to the boy's recovery if he were to have the tattoos removed by laser surgeries. But they were a family of modest means and could not afford such medical procedures. The family turned to the church where the abuse occurred for financial help. The church in turn sought advice from a lawyer. The lawyer cautioned that if the church provided financial assistance to the family, it might be construed as an admission that the church was responsible for the sexual abuse that had occurred. The church asked me for my opinion. As a person born and formed by the faith and values of my parents, my wife and children, and my extended family, I told the church that if it was financially able to assist the family, it should consider doing so. Not because it was responsible for the harm that had been done, 
but because it wanted to be responsible for the healing that needed to occur. And the time to start being responsible was now. Another time that I've seen need to give voice to our faith is when God's love and justice for all people needs to be more fully proclaimed. That is in part why, as a person whose faith matured at the Chicago Theological Seminary, and as a lawyer for the United Church of Christ, I recommended and just three weeks ago caused the filing in the United States District Court for the Western District of North Carolina a lawsuit contesting the constitutionality of that state's marriage laws. <laughs> laws which make it a criminal offense for clergy to cause people of faith to gather and solemnize in a religious ceremony the commitment of two loving same-sex adults. No law should restrict the free exercise of religious belief. The threat of prosecution and penalty for ministers in North Carolina is real, and laws that limit the free exercise of religious belief must be revoked. These laws criminalize ministers for following their faith, their conscience, and for offering pastoral care and worship services equally to all parishioners. While our lawsuit focuses on the free exercise of religion, we also share a belief in the equal treatment of our gay and lesbian families and friends. For almost 40 years, the United Church of Christ has advocated for the equality of LGBT people. As a church, we stand for fair treatment for all. We were an abolitionist church, one of the first in the country to stand against slavery and we're the first predominantly white denomination to ordain an African American. We stood up for the rights of women and ordained the first female pastor. We were active in the civil rights dem demonstrations of this century. We stood beside and still stand beside the fight for LGBT equality. In fact, we were the first denomination to ordain an openly gay pastor more than 40 years ago and the first mainline Christian denomination to support same-sex marriage. We did not bring this lawsuit to make others conform to our religious beliefs. We brought the lawsuit to vindicate the rights of all people to freely exercise their beliefs and for equal treatment under the law of all God's children. While North Carolina's marriage laws attempt to restrict gay marriage, they also are restricting basic rights that we cherish as Americans. As my friend, the Reverend Ben Guess, Executive Minister of Local Church Ministries for the UCC has recently reminded us, the United Church of Christ is a profoundly American church. We are the Church of the Pilgrims and we remain the largest Protestant church in New England. More than 10% of our current churches were formed before 1776 and 11 signers of the Declaration of Independence were members of churches that now make up the United Church of Christ. It was our people and our churches who inspired the Boston Tea Party and who hid the Liberty Bell from the occupying British in Philadelphia. We know how to be good Americans. So as good Americans, we stand in that patriotic lineage just as we stand faithful to the inclusive gospel of Jesus Christ in this important stand for the freedom of all Americans and for the free exercise of religious beliefs. And the time to take this stand was now. Why am I telling you these stories about some of the times when and how I have tried to bring the faith forward? In part, it's because it would be understandable on this day of accomplishment for you to have some sense that you have arrived or at least that you will soon focus on where you will apply your new skills and learnings, perhaps in a church, a school, or a not-for-profit institution. It would be understandable, too, on this day of adding abbreviations to your resume, MDiv, PhD, or the like, that you may soon be focused on a new title or position, perhaps pastor, 
professor or executive director. But I would encourage you not to focus so much on who you may become or where you may end up, but rather on how you will get there. Margaret Wheatley, an author brought to my attention by Reverend Linda Jaramillo, the Executive Minister for Justice and Witness Ministries in the United Church of Christ, has referred to this as the difference between destination and direction. If you are too focused on a destination in life, what your job, your title, or your status will be, you may miss opportunities that are presented to you along the way. As Ms. Wheatley writes, most of us think we know where we are going, or at least think we should know where we are going. Knowing where we want to end up seems essential. But once we know what our destination is, we too easily get trapped by desire, holding our hopes tightly, intent on reaching our goal, working to implement the plan to reach the dream. All this focus and dedication can place huge blinders on us. We may be diligent, but we're also dangerously myopic. And it severely inhibits our relationship with life. We're so intent on getting somewhere or becoming someone in particular that we shut out and shut down. We silence the messages coming from our world. We don't take in information we just plow ahead with ever more determination. Goodbye to curiosity, farewell to experimentation. When I graduated with my law degree in 1979, it was inconceivable that I would one day become the general counsel of a religious faith community. Unimaginable that I would leave a corporate litigation practice and among other things, seek restorative justice for those who've been sexually exploited or argue in favor of marriage equality for my gay and lesbian brothers and sisters. But a faithful life is a journey, and you and I should not pretend that we know where it will or should end. As stated in the constitution of the denomination with which this seminary is affiliated, it's the responsibility of the church in each generation to make this faith its own in reality of worship, in honesty of thought and expression, and in purity of heart before God. We are not likely to do that if we follow familiar roads to fixed places. Our first congregational song today written by a Church of Scotland minister from the Iona community on that blessed isle. Don't think I didn't notice, Professor Haldeman. And bearing a title, The Summons, that as a lawyer I can particularly relate to, <laughs> makes clear that we are not summoned to a place or position, but to a way of life, a way of being. God's call to us in this regard is clear, and the portions of Psalm 81 read to us today record God's accompanying plea. If my people would only listen to me. Chicago Theological Seminary has tried to listen attentively. It rightfully speaks of preparing leaders for the next. It acknowledges that to a large degree, what is next cannot be known. What can be known is that change and challenge will fill your days. And thus, as leaders, you, the graduates of this class of 2014, will need the ability to anticipate and respond to surprise and uncertainty. The ability to anticipate and recognize change and lead transitions. The ability to operate on intent through trust, empowerment, and understanding the ability to think critically in the moment, wherever you may be. As I have said before, we need you to lead this way because the world needs CTS people. There is a world out there that needs people to tell it that the way we are now is not all that we can hope to be. There is a government out there that needs people to tell it that the hope of the world does not lie in war 
There is an environment out there that needs people to resurrect. Yes, the world needs CTS people. Brave, joyous, loud, at times misbehaving CTS people. So to each and to all, to those who walked here and those who rolled here, to those who came with people they love and to those who came alone, to the visitors and the regulars, to the first timers and the old timers, to the believers and the disbelievers, to the tourists and the trustees, join me in celebrating and encouraging these graduates because they are God's children, because we need them, because the world needs CTS people. Graduation can be viewed as an end. You've completed your courses, finished your papers, and concluded all that is required of you to be acknowledged by one of the finest seminaries in the country. But I encourage you to view it as a beginning, the start of something important in your life and the lives of others. Don't mistake destination for destiny. Set your moral compass and chart a direction that will guide you wherever it may lead. Let your faith be bigger than your fears. Translate your education into action, responsibility rather than role. As a lawyer and a person of faith, I encourage you to view your graduation today not as your closing argument, but rather as your opening statement. And let your light shine at all times, wherever you may go from here. Thank you.
Chairman Williams, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, students, and all friends of Chicago Theological Seminary. The prophet declares, if you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger, the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. Then shall you be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. Today, we honor one we know as a repairer of the breach, a restorer of justice so that people may survive and thrive. Donald Cameron Clark, Jr., one who has devoted his life to the service of the church, to excellence in theological education, and to the increase of justice and mercy throughout society. After receiving his Juris Doctor from Rutgers Camden Law School in 1979, where he was the editor of the Rutgers Law Journal, Donald Cameron Clark served as a litigation partner in two of Chicago's largest law firms for nearly a decade. He then created and managed his own litigation boutique before answering the call to serve the United Church of Christ, where he is now general counsel, advising the denomination of over one million members and over 5,000 churches. While he defends the interests of the United Church of Christ with diligence and skill, he also uses his position to advance larger causes of justice in the whole of society most recently taking the lead role in filing on behalf of the United Church of Christ a lawsuit challenging the state of North Carolina's constitutional amendment banning same-sex marriage on the grounds that it violates the right to free exercise of religion guaranteed in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution since United Church of Christ clergy who wish to perform marriage ceremonies for same-sex couples are unable to do so legally. A brilliant legal strategy vintage Clark. Don also lends his gifts as a litigator generously beyond ecclesiastical disputes. For example, he successfully argued pro bono Hamilton versus the state of Alabama and won the reversal of a wrongful capital murder conviction and death sentence, saving a life. And his gifts extend beyond the legal realm. His articles have appeared in legal journals, of course, but also in the Christian century where he reflected on sex abuse in the church. He speaks widely on church polity and governance, as well as legal issues for church and clergy. He even teaches graduate courses, such as his legal issues in contemporary parish ministry for our students here at Chicago Theological Seminary. He has held public office and served on numerous boards at institutions as diverse as the Adler Planetarium and Church World Service. Of special importance to us, however, is his service as a member and chair of the Board of Trustees of Chicago Theological Seminary. At a crucial time in the life of our school, Donald Cameron Clark was called by God to use his many gifts to further our mission in the world. From fiercely negotiating the sale of our old building, through the design of our new, beautiful, Leeds Gold Certified, technologically capable building, to our amb ambitious move to offer a world-class online degree, Don has led CTS with aplomb, generosity, creativity, diligence, integrity, and love, consistently challenging us to be all that we are called to be. He has demonstrated through his leadership what he has said many times, the world needs CTS people. Don is also, of course, a grandfather extraordinaire, a kilt wearer, an avid Blackhawks fan, a connoisseur of Scotch whiskey and steak, a rabble-rousing Republican in a sea of Democrats, and a curling champion. He loves to be told something cannot be done because then he sets about doing it. He is a repairer of the breach, a restorer of streets on which people may live in peace. For all these reasons and more, Mr. Williams, Chair of the Board, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to present to you Donald Cameron Clark, Jr. for the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. Donald Cameron Clark, Jr., because you have served CTS, 
the United Church of Christ, and the wider church, the enterprise of theological education, and the world with vision, compassion, wisdom, and chutzpah, because you believe with your whole being that the world needs CTS people, and because you are a repair of the breach, I am pleased to award you the degree of Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa and admit you to all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. I direct that you be invested with the hood of this high degree and present you this diploma. President Hunt, Mr. Williams, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, staff, students, and all friends of the Chicago Theological Seminary. The Right Reverend George Washington Carver Walker Sr. is the 81st Bishop in succession of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Elected at the 43rd General Conference of 1988, he presided over the areas now known as the Western and Southwestern Delta Episcopal Districts, as well as the Northeastern and Piedmont Episcopal Districts until his retirement as Senior Bishop in 2012. Like the scientist whose name he carries, George Washington Carver Walker Sr. is a man of vision, indomitable will, and impeccable grace to follow a vision through to manifestation. Born in Montgomery, Alabama to the Reverend Roosevelt Leon and Mrs. Lemon Louise Pace Walker, Bishop Walker is a graduate of Clinton Junior College, Benedict College, and Hood Theological Seminary. He was ordained a deacon and an elder in the PD conference under the late Bishop Daniel Pope. The then Reverend Walker married a teacher, the gifted, gracious, and lovely Geraldine Jackson, and they have four children, the Reverend Dr. Dwayne Walker, the Reverend George Walker Jr., Cynthia Walker Carr, and Deborah Walker Richmond. Mrs. Walker very ably assisted her husband during his successive and successful pastoring of four churches in South Carolina before coming to Chicago and the Greater Walters AME Zion Church, where they served for 16 years until his elevation to the Episcopacy and her appointment as missionary supervisor. Since their retirement at the end of the last quadrennium, Bishop and Mrs. Walker have returned to their church family as active members. Bishop Walker's love for the AME Zion Church is breathtaking when we consider the great stewardship he has given to lift up its heritage and ensure its ongoing viability and impact in the world. He is the immediate past chair of the Harriet Tubman Home, which the heroine of the Underground Railroad deeded to the AME Zion Church and was already a historic landmark. By establishing the home as a corporation, he made it eligible for government funding support while keeping it privately owned by the AME Zion Church. That was no small feat. His vision, tenacity, and trust in God are legendary. We in the AME Zion Church who know his dedication are following in the footsteps of a giant of the Christian faith. Because of Bishop Walker's leadership, the AME Zion Church has prospered immensely. Through his tenacity, commitment to 
justice, and theological vision, he reclaimed a place for the Freedom Church on the front lines of civil and human rights activism. He offered one of the most stirring and spiritually inclusive opening prayers at the Million Man March in October 1995. He marched for justice on behalf of the Genesis in central Louisiana in 2006 and 2007, and led prayers for the family of the slain black youth, Trayvon Martin of Sanford, Florida. His love for the people of God is a medical, interreligious, and intercultural in scope. He participated in the great gathering of black Methodists in Columbia, South Carolina in March of 2010, and is an active member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the National Council of Churches, the World Methodist Church Council, and the World Council of Churches. Through his involvement in the Bomb in Gilead, a nonprofit organization dedicated to the healing of AIDS through prayer, education, advocacy, and service, he has led the Amy Zion Church in America and abroad in making a passionate, compassionate response to people with HIV and AIDS, as well as the families and loved ones affected by the pandemic. To a world wracked with pain, Bishop Walker has brought the healing virtues of a loving gospel. To a world seemingly given over to the thoughtless killers of youth and their dreams, Bishop Walker has given advocacy on behalf of those who suffer loss. In a world riven by racism, Bishop Walker has leaned into the prophetic tradition of Jesus Christ by speaking nothing less than the truth in love and by demanding justice, the antidote to oppression of any kind. In so doing, he lifted high and was lifted high by the Spirit of Christ and the Amy Zion Church's luminaries, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and Frederick Douglass, and others too numerous to name here who sought wisdom and fought for peace. President Hunt, it is my honor to present to you the Right Reverend George Washington Carver Walker Sr. for the degree Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa.
Will the candidate for the Certificate in Theological Studies please rise? <laughs> President Hunt, I present to you the candidate for the Certificate in Theological Studies who has been certified by the registrar as having met all the qualifications and requirements and is recommended by the faculty for investiture with the certificate. You have satisfactorily completed six or more graduate courses in biblical, theological, and ministry studies. You have fulfilled the requirements of this seminary for the certificate of theological studies. Therefore, upon recommendation of the faculty and by vote of the Board of Trustees, I am pleased to confer upon you the Certificate in Theological Studies. Marion Louise McKinney. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts please rise? <laughs> President Hunt, I present to you the candidates for the degree of Master of Arts who have been certified by the registrar as having met all the qualifications and requirements and are recommended by the faculty for investiture with the degree. You have satisfactorily completed two years of graduate work and demonstrated your capacity to interpret theological, ethical, and religious traditions by successfully writing and defending an academic thesis. Each of you has fulfilled the requirements of this seminary for the degree of Master of Arts. Therefore, upon recommendation of the faculty and by vote of the Board of Trustees, I am pleased to confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts by causing you to be invested with the hood of the degree and by awarding you a diploma. Louis Henry Bedard. Timothy Layden Crum. Sarah Margaret Hairston. Heather Loring Albright. <laughs> Rachel Kathleen Lenar in absentia. Jacob Donald Thomas Scott. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Divinity please rise? President Hunt, I present to you these candidates for the degree of Master of Divinity, who are certified by the Registrar as having met all the qualifications and requirements, and are recommended by the faculty for investiture with the degree. You have satisfactorily completed three years of graduate work and demonstrated your preparation for the many forms ministry takes. 
You have done so academically, spiritually, socially, culturally, and through field experience. Each of you has fulfilled the requirements of this seminary for the degree of Master of Divinity. Therefore, upon recommendation of the faculty and by vote of the Board of Trustees, I am pleased to confer upon you the degree of Master of Divinity by causing you to be invested with the hood of this degree and by awarding you a diploma. Amy Ashleman. Esther Baruha. Jeffrey Allen Dodson. James Russell Fisher. Jessica R. Palace.
Robin Stillman. Stillman. Rachel E. W. Weasley. <laughs> Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Sacred Theology please rise? President Hunt, I present to you these candidates for the degree of Master of Sacred Theology, who are certified by the Registrar as having met all the qualifications and requirements, and are recommended by the faculty for investiture with the degree. Having previously earned a graduate degree in theological studies, you have completed an additional year of focused academic work and successfully written and defended an academic thesis. You have fulfilled the requirements of this seminary for the degree of Master of Sacred Theology. Therefore, upon recommendation of the faculty and by vote of the Board of Trustees, I am pleased to confer upon you the degree of Master of Sacred Theology by causing you to be invested with the hood of this degree and by awarding you a diploma. Christina Annette Cataldo. Chi Chen, Wesley Chen. Carolyn R. Notarangelo. <laughs> Pumps up shim in absentia. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Ministry please rise? <laughs> President Hunt, I present to you these candidates for the degree of Doctor of who are certified by the Registrar as having met all the qualifications and requirements and are recommended by the faculty for investiture with the degree. Having previously earned a Master of Divinity degree or its equivalent, and after spending a number of years competently practicing the profession of ministry, each of you has fulfilled this seminary's requirements for the degree of Doctor of Ministry. You have done so through academic work, field experience, and the successful writing and defense of a professional paper. Therefore, upon recommendation of the faculty and by vote of the Board of Trustees, I am pleased to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Ministry by causing you to be invested with the hood of this degree and by awarding you a diploma. Young Sook Choi. Thomas John Dennis.
Richard Joseph Ryan. David Brandon Lindsay. Sean Catherine Salter. Naomi Elaine Tyler Lloyd. Having previously earned a master's degree in the appropriate discipline, you have fulfilled the seminary's requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. You have done so through substantial advanced study under the guidance of the seminary's PhD faculty and through the writing and successful defense of a scholarly interdisciplinary dissertation. Therefore, upon recommendation of the Doctor of Philosophy Center and the authorization of the faculty and by vote of the Board of Trustees, I am pleased to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy by causing you to be invested with the hood of this degree and by giving you this diploma. Sancho Lee in absentia. The title of Dr. Lee's dissertation is The Turn to the Other, A Conversation with Levinasian Ethics and Minjum Theology. Carolyn Jean Roncalato.
ladies and gentlemen, the class of 2014.
My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Word. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. That is how you will know it is God's house. Not by who is kept out, but by how many are welcome. More and more and more. Those who were no people become God's people. Those who had no name have an everlasting name. Those who had no tomorrow have life everlasting. Those who must not touch become those who embrace. Those who need justice receive justice. Those who need mercy receive mercy. Those who were as dead are alive. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. Word of God by the prophet Isaiah, thus says the God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather still others besides those I have already gathered. Still others, more and more. This is how you will know the house of God. By the astonishment of those who enter to find who else is there. There and welcome. Welcome, as the revelation has it, with a great multitude beyond number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. not suppose that anyone is adequate to this word of God. Even great faith, great understanding, great courage recoil from the wonder of this word. Who has faith enough, hope enough, love enough? Who has understanding enough? Who has enough courage, enough imagination, enough mind, enough spirit? The house of my own heart is too small. The house of my own heart is too small. So I was glad. I was glad when they said to me, let us go up to the house of the Lord. For the sake of the house of God, I will seek your good. God's house. Where we can join faith to faith, hope to hope, love to love. God's house where we can join understanding to understanding, courage to courage, heart to heart, more and more and more. Full of tribes, tongues, nations, God's house, which alone is great enough to contain the wonder of this word. My house shall be a house of prayer for all people. Think about this word. Meditate. Think about it when you rise up and when you lie down and when you walk by the way. Teach it to your children. Inscribe it on the doorposts of your own heart. Inscribe it on the doorposts of your own heart. My house shall be called the house of prayer for all people. We could go up together could go up together, sister, brother, neighbor, stranger, enemy. We could go up together, but only together, only together. 
with nothing in our hands but our need for each other, our need for this other person whose face is the inviolable sign of God's word to us. We could go up together into the welcome of the house of welcome. Into the welcome of the house of welcome. The house of justice and mercy. The house, the house of astonishment. The house of God. More and more and more. Grace and peace. Truly I tell you, 
No prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. Our questions, our answers, our truth, our word may not be accepted by everyone, even by some we love dearly. Yet we can't be in silence anymore. The divine has filled our hearts with her spirit. So now we also follow prophet Audrey Lord when she said, and when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcome. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. We were never meant to survive because we were in captivity until God's hand brought us here to follow the way of Jesus. And what is that but to bring news to the poor and to the outcast and to the immigrant and to the 99% and to the 1% who need to think about the 99% and to the one who can pay her medical bills and to the one who is in so much pain and despair that he doesn't want to hear about God anymore and only needs a silent presence. And this good news that is also for us because we are just as fragile and weak as the people we want to take care of and who receive a strength from God just as well. The good news is that the divine is bigger than our conceptions of religion consecrated in doctrines and dogmas. The good news is that no matter who you are, where you are, what you believe, what really matters is the love that we have for one another during the time we walk together in solidarity and in mutuality. Because what we have done in grace and love, in kindness, in mercy, ultimately is what the world has inspired us to do. So, Professor Richardson, on behalf of the class of 2014, I accept your charge and go inspired by the world to hear and to speak the good news that our captivity is over and we are all free. God bless you all, or as we say in my native indigenous language from Paraguay, that literally means, may God caress your faces. Amen.
light and darkness. You who create all things, heaven and earth and all its creatures, everything that is seen as well as what is unseen. You shine upon us like living worlds, yet we climb to the shadows. You lead us through valleys of dark shadows, yet we go astray. Call to us again, somehow who we may be. Lead us beside still water, provoke us to wakefulness, entice us to the world of welcoming in your reign. Guide us in path of righteousness, in deeds of mercy and peace, as we feed the hungry and shelter those who with our homes, as we touch those who are still with your healing balm, and console those who mourn, as we visit those in prison and welcome the stranger to table. Guide us in time of trouble and uncertainty, as we hear of wars and wonder of wars, as city burn and our children are shoot death in the streets, as even praise of higher learning become praise of conflict, misunderstanding and uncertainty. Comfort those who mourn, those grieving children or parents, spouse, friend, or courage with assurance of your promise of everlasting life. Embrace those who are afraid. Search out those who are lost. Reconcile those in conflict. For all these things, and for all the concerns and hopes and joys, that we, your people, hold silently even now in our hearts. God of light and darkness, marker, maker of all that is seen and unseen, listen, attend, as that we may know you are with us. And so step up on faith to do justice, communicate mercy, and walk in humility this day and every day. And then all who may say, Beloved fellow graduates, we entered Chicago Theological Seminary responding to God's call upon our lives as one seeking, questioning, longing for this world to be different, better, more just, more inclusive. As we leave Chicago Theological Seminary, we are much the same, still seeking, questioning, longing, and responding. And yet, we have also been transformed by this place, by its people and its mission. Through the guidance of many here and many who have gone before us, we stand here today and journey on to tomorrow. With thankful hearts, let us rise and turn to offer our gratitude to those here today who have supported us. To members of the staff of CTS, for your dedication, diligence, and care, for all you have done to help us reach this day, for your assistance with registration, tuition payments, and financial aid, for keeping our efforts, providing technical support, and maintaining the facilities for we learned. We thank you. To the faculty.
love you. And now let us pray. Giver of all good gifts, source of mercy, spirit of justice, font of peace. We rejoice and give thanks for this day. We thank you for the path you have set before us. We thank you for your presence beside us. We thank you for transforming us through this journey of faith and study. Guide us now as we go out into a weird world, so that our hands and our voices may proclaim your good news to all we Fill us with a renewed passion for your kingdom for a planet disarmed, for a world transformed. We lift all of these things to you, even as you call us onward still, to seek, to question, to respond, and to transform. I pray this in the name of Jesus, one of many names by which those gathered here call to you in prayer. And all God's people said, Amen. Please rise in body or spirit for the benediction. May the Holy One, who has walked with us on this journey of learning, discerning, and discovering, continue to bless us on our way as we touch the lives of those in churches and classrooms, neighborhoods and nations, striving ever to build a beloved community and hasten the coming of God's promised kingdom on earth. May the Holy One who gives and sustains life guide our feet, strengthen our hearts, focus our words, and preserve our going out from this place, blessing all that we do as we sow love, grace, and peace throughout the world. May the Holy One strengthen and bless us with peace, go in peace as you go with God.
we did one through four when we were here three weeks.